Hi everyone, welcome back to Sugar Mama's Fire Play Podcast. I am financial planner, Canna Campbell. Really exciting today. I am recording this on my desktop with my microphone and I'm also recording with my camera. So you can not only listen to this, but you can see me making this podcast. Now, a quick reminder up front to make sure that you're following me on Instagram at Sugar Mama TV because this is where I provide you with all the immediate access swipe up links so that you're not having to jump across like YouTube, Instagram, my website to access my content. Everything is just housed there. So I, it's just, I want all that saving you as much time and energy as possible. So make sure you're following me there. And of course, you're always welcome to following me on my normal account at Canna Campbell official and you can see inside my life with the kids my pregnancy Tom you know living in Sydney Australia down near Bondi Beach and our life out and about there all right so today we're gonna to be talking about one of my favorite subjects something I'm really passionate about actually two subjects that I'm really passionate about and that is minimalism and money I want to share with you how I do minimalism and money, the hacks, the steps that I follow, my headspace, how I approach things. And hopefully by me sharing all of this with you, you can take parts of it or all of it and apply it to your own life so that you have more clarity, more purpose, and best of all, you have more efficiency. You know, I don't believe we should be spending all of our spare time working on our financial goals. Life is all about balance, spending time with our family, spending time with our friends, spending time on our own, having time to, you know, go for a run or do a yoga class or, you know, meditate or go for a swim in the ocean or travel, um, you know, being able to learn new skills, new hobbies, whether it be cooking, a new language or, you know, some sort of spiritual development and connection. And of course, having time for our planet. My gosh, we've done so much damage to our planet. It's something I've become increasingly aware of and concerned about, like wanting to do my part in helping I guess reverse all the damage that I have done over the last, you know, however many decades I've been here. And um, so this is about minimalism and money. All right. I like to always explain to people how I fell into minimalism. When I had Rocco, I got really bad post-traumatic stress syndrome and postnatal depression. I felt really overwhelmed and like I was suffocating and stuff. And I remember this defining moment. I was sitting on this, the kitchen um, sort of armchair and I looked around me and I was, there was there were sterilizer there were bottles there were plastic brightly colored toys I was just like this it felt like a cage around me and I just felt so overwhelmed I didn't know I couldn't breathe I couldn't didn't know where to begin I couldn't see through the fog and somehow I I came across minimalism online I think it was the minimalist but may couldn't have been I'm not sure I'm not 100% sure I was in such a dark moment of my life and I simply from that point on decided to start removing things from my life, realizing I don't really need that. So why am I holding on to it? Let it go. And every time I let something go, I cleared the decks. I created space in my life to allow more light to shine in, to allow purpose and clarity and direction to return back to my life. And it was a significant tool and technique and strategy in helping me overcome this really dark period of my life. And I've never let it go since I'm really protective of it. And, you know, it started out in my kitchen with all the baby stuff. And that was, a, for me, it was a really easy place to start. But then it infiltrated into my wardrobe, going through the clothes that don't fit me anymore and the clothes that I don't really like anymore. Or the, you know, and it, I got a greater, I guess, definition or a more defined um, value system when it comes to minimalism because I, I, you know, really st started to say, not only just cutting down my clothing and my consumption, but also saying no to fast fashion being uh, really embracing the pre-loved community and, and trying to buy as much as I can possibly in the pre-loved secondhand clothing market. It also, you know, minimalism flowed into my social life, you know, looking at the people that I was around, um, you know, energy is contagious and I'm aware my energy is contagious just as, as much as the person I'm hanging out with, but, you know, not spreading myself too thinly, making sure I spend time with people who I really value rather than feeling obliged to say yes to go to this social event, that social event, and of course, into the way that I use money and because obviously I'm a financial planner and I've been passionate about money and financial well-being and building our passive income stream and being financially independent I actually probably have always been a minimalist when it comes to money anyway but I started to be more aware of it so I could actually define it articulate it and therefore share it 
All right, so these are the, I'm gonna say eight, but it's not in any particular order. Um, but these are the, I guess, the eight areas or things that I wanna share with you in this podcast about minimalism and money. First of all, I have all of my personal bank accounts uh, with one bank. Uh, we bank with Macquarie Bank. Our home loan is with Macquarie, our investment loans are with Macquarie Bank, um, our share portfolio is with Macquarie Bank, um, all our personal family accounts, day-to-day -day banking accounts, um, emergency money, everything like that is in the one account, Macquarie Bank. And this is not product advice, so please keep that in mind. The reason why I recommend you have either all of your accounts with the one bank, or the next best thing is to have use an app where you can view all of your accounts together on the one screen is because it allows you to see your whole entire financial situation on the one screen. Also, it allows you to immediately move money across um, instantly. So say for example, I need to pay a bill from um, you know, our savings account or I need to pay for say books and flights. I can take that money out of our holiday savings account into our everyday family account immediately and pay for that that those airfare or the accommodation, whatever it may be. But it saves you a lot of time. There's no logging in and out of different apps and there's no waiting, oh, hang on, I can't pay for that until the money's come through the next day or damn, I'm transferring it over the weekend. I've now got to wait two or three days for the money to come through. Everything's instant. So it's really about the efficiency and getting a complete clear understanding of where we stand financially. So in that one screen, I can see my you know credit card statement. I can see my share portfolio. I can see, um, our family account, Tom's individual um, spending account, my individual spending account, absolutely everything. It's just so transparent. And I will point out, and I highly recommend you listen to this this other podcast I published a couple of months ago, how we do money as a modern day family, because I share with you how we manage our budget, how Tom and I manage our incomes together and our financial goals. If you, if you can't put all your accounts together, at least use one of the various apps that are available. And I think 86400 has one where you can actually link all of your banks and different bank accounts to view it on the one screen. It adds so much more efficiency um, and simplicity to your life and you really do have a clear understanding of where you stand. The next um, thing is, and this is an important one, so uh, I'm gonna take my time and explain it. I match my bills with my pay cycle. So I get paid at the beginning of every single month. Um, and I pay all our pr priority bills upfront the moment the money hits our account. So for example, I will pay our council rates, our electricity bills, our Foxtel, um, our water, um, all the, you know, the, the, I guess the bulky upfront essentials from our groceries even, I pay all of those upfront and I pay them monthly. So for example, you take a quarterly bill, like a council bill that's normally, you know, paid, you know, issued every three months. And this is when often what gets people into trouble is these bills that are irregular, they don't match their pay cycles. And so they forget about, oh crap, I've got not, you know, that upcoming quarterly gas bill or electricity bill or strata bill or council bill. So what I do is I actually pay it one month upfront in advance. So say for example, typically uh, council rates are say $300 per quarter. The moment I get paid, I immediately, through the biller code, transfer $100 each month. So technically by the time that, you know, $300 quarterly um, council rate bill is due, it's actually already been paid. It's been paid in full. And sometimes it's actually in credit by $100 because I've paid it a month in advance. Now, the benefit of doing this is I'm always on top of my, my bills. I never need to worry about being caught out or ever jeopardizing my credit rating. Um, it also means you know, I've got whatever is left over, I can then allocate for the other essentials, you know, such as food or clothing or any, any special entertainment that we want to do. But I've prioritized the big, big ticket, the essentials. And I've created, and this is really important, I've created consistency because as I just said, often when people have got themselves into credit card debt or some sort of financial difficulty or, or struggle, it's because they've had difficulty and by no fault of them because it's never really been taught, they have had difficulty juggling a flat, consistent, regular income that comes from earning a salary with irregular expenses. So we might have a quiet month where we don't really have many expenses. And then we might have a month where we have, for example, two of our best friend's birthdays. It might be also say, you know, Mother's Day or some sort of um, religious festivity. Or we might forget, oh my goodness, our car rego 
and CTPs due at the same time, which could be like $1,500. That ad hoc or irregular large lump sum expense, particularly when it collides with other things that go on in our lives, is often when we don't have enough money in our everyday account to get us through the pay cycle. And that's when we reach for a credit card to get out of us. And I really believe when you're in credit card debt, it's such a toxic place to be to our headspace. We kind of take this, oh, how do I say, this kind of self-destructive attitude. We're like, oh, I'm already in $500 worth of credit card debt. What's another $100, you know, you know. And, you know, we, we have this attitude. So before we know it, we've gone from $500 into credit card debt to $600 to credit card debt to $900 to credit card debt. Oh, we may as well make it another thousand and we'll address it all in one big swoop of a thousand dollars. That's why I really um, am very careful of being in debt and not actually ever creating in the first place because it does create this kind of self-destructive pattern and behavior. So what I try and recommend you do if you're looking at incorporating Millism into your life is obviously number one, have a bank account, all but the same accounts. And I will also flag my business bank's accounts are with another bank. They're actually with St. George Bank. And I keep them separate because they're two very different tax structures and tax systems and I never want to blend or mix up my cash flow. Second thing is I said, try and create your pay and your expenses to match your pay cycle. So treat your bills monthly, even if they're not monthly, treat them monthly. Or if you get paid quarterly, or if you get paid say fortnightly, treat your bills fortnightly. And all I do is I simply grab a bill, look at the biller code on that bill and use that to prepay. And not once have I ever had someone call me, like my energy company or my gas provider or my the strata, sorry, the strata or the council rates ever call me and say, hey, stop paying us early and a monthly month in advance. No, no one ever complains. My bills are always upfront and, and um, I never need to worry about creating so much more space in my life to worry about other things. The next is the logistics of what's inside my wallet. How do I, as a minimalist, how do I incorporate minimalism in my wallet? Now, if someone wants to stole my wallet, I hate to say this, but uh, they're going to be really disappointed. It's a really nice wallet. I love my wallet, but it's little and there isn't really much in there. It's quite skinny, um, particularly at the moment because my daughter, Apple, has actually got this really bad habit of going through my wallet and throwing the ATM debit cards across the room. Now, inside my wallet is number one, a debit card, a debit card to my personal everyday account. And this is the account which I pay for my gym membership, coffees, lunches, if I want to go out for dinner with my girlfriends, if I want to buy myself, say, you know, a top or a pair of shoes or some sneakers or something like that, it comes out of that account. The second debit card is my family debit card. And Tom also has one of these cards as well, but it's where we pay all of our family living expenses. So, you know, our uh, groceries, if we get a babysitter for the night, which is at the moment is, is very rare. Um, if we need to buy some clothing for the kids or Rocco's piano lessons or Apple's like playgroup that I take her to. Anything that involves the family's living expenses come out of this card. And I'm gonna mention, these are debit cards, not credit cards. And as I said, Tom also has the same, um, has a, a card linked to the same account. So he can, if he's driving home and needs to grab some groceries, he can use that, that account too. And I will also point out, we have the one app um, on each of our phones so we can each see what, what each other are doing with our cash flow at any time. There's complete and utter honesty and transparency because as a minimalist, you don't have time for lies and deception and deceit. We have one credit card. Now, Tom actually has this card as well, but he doesn't use it, so he's actually put it in a safe spot. I do have the credit card, and um, sometimes it's not even in my wallet. Sometimes I also pull it out, but at the moment I've got um, lots of medical expenses coming in because obviously we're having a baby and lots of scans and checkups all the time, so I, I do keep my credit card on me. But with the credit card, we actually pay it when we use it. So. Say for example, I have to go and get you know a five hundred dollar scan, uh, either when I've walked out of that scan, or when I get home that night, or even worst case scenario at the end of the week, I will actually transfer money from our savings account to that credit card. So there's never really any money ever really owing on that card. It's it's always in credit. I don't like getting a letter in, in the mail or an email saying it's time to pay your credit card. I always like to know, actually, no, no, it's already paid. I don't need to worry about it. And one other little hack I would like to share is I quite often round up. So for example, say I am buying myself something really special such as a, a, a dress. And say the dress comes to say $180. 
I will actually go and transfer $200 to my credit card so that not only is there nothing ever owing on my card, but there's actually a little bit of a, a buffer, a bit of a surplus because at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year, you know, there might be like three, $400 rounded up, say as additional credit on my credit card and I can go and, you know, reward myself and buy myself something nice. And there's something really comforting knowing about that. Like it's really responsible and wise. And, you know, particularly at the end of the year, I can use that maybe for Christmas presents if I'm, you know, wanting to spend a little bit more than what I plan. So I don't have loyalty cards in my, if I, if I do have a loyalty card, which there aren't that many of them, um, I save it electronically. And also now with most, most people don't really like having loyalty cards, like coffee cards and stuff like that. You can normally have them saved online in the store and use them there. But really it's so boring inside my wallet. You've got your, I've got my health insurance card. I've got my driver's license. I've got my two debit cards and uh, the one credit card. And that's pretty much it. And I also will point out, I have one frequent flyer program, which is Qantas. And none of this video is, uh, or podcast is sponsored whatsoever, but my credit card, the one credit card that I do have is linked to my Qantas frequent flyer account. So that if I do use it, I'm collecting points along the way. And particularly if I'm buying something, paying for something that's expensive, you know, like in frugal February, we had to buy a new freezer or fridge, a fridge freezer. I paid for it on that credit card so I could get, you know, the frequent flyer points. And of course I transfer the money straight away. I want to maximize my points. I want them to accumulate as quickly as possible. I don't want to be spreading them across four or five different frequent flyer programs or loyalty programs. I want them all going in the one direction so I can quickly and easily save up for, a, you know, an airfare or multiple airfares even better. So that's my, my debit card and my inside my, the depths of my wallet. So really simple. Not much to steal in my wallet, really quite disappointing and boring. The next thing is social media. This is one that I, anyone that comes and sees me in one of my Zoom consultations, which is a general advice educational based appointment. And that is, uh, be very careful of who you follow on social media. If you are someone who loves to shop, loves fashion, or has a particular uh, squanders life for spending money on gadgets or restaurants or um, just things in life where they're starting is detrimental to their financial well-being and I'm not saying stop spending money on clothes or stop spending money on going to nice restaurants or anything like that it's all about your value system but if you're finding your lifestyle is starting to erode into your financial well-being causing stress um, and pressure in your life then this is where you can start to make life easier for yourself. You're removing temptation. So on social media, I'm really careful as to who I follow. I follow people who are I admire and they're living an authentic life. They're living a life with a, a value system that I am intrigued by, I admire. And these are people quite often from the debt-free community. Uh, they're people, other fellow minimalists. They're people who eat very healthily. They're people who exercise a lot or I shouldn't say a lot because that's probably the wrong word but they exercise mindfully or they they exercise and take care of their bodies with from a place of love and compassion and they nurture their bodies in the right type of way I'm also really careful about like the fashion brands that I follow I love fashion I love I like nice things I like luxuries um, however if I follow too many people that have the latest handbag or the latest pair of shoes or the most uh, trendiest designer outfit I'm going to get tempted to go and jump on that, you know, that, that store website or that store's account and spend money that I, I don't actually have. And this is where we, we get into trouble because we waste precious energy and time trying to avoid things where if we just simply took them out of, out of our path, we'd be so much more efficient in getting through our goals and, and sticking to our path and our journey. Kind of like if you put yourself on a, on a diet and I'm not a, advocating it as a diet or anyone needs to lose weight or get healthier here but I'm just using this as an example but if I say to myself all right I really want to try and eat healthily this week I want to like eat less sugar I want to eat more vegetables particularly green vegetables I want to eat more fruit I want to make sure I drink two liters of water each day by having a fridge full of chocolate and potato chips and you know uh, fatty dips and snacks and crackers and things that are not going to be good for my health I'm going to make it really hard to get through the entire week with with breaking um you know tr and i'll end up breaking my my goals so just if you have a fridge full of fresh fruits and vegetables things that you can grab easily that are really nutritious you're going to more likely to achieve that goal it's the same with social media i'm really careful as to who i follow and if you ever are looking for people to inspire you to achieve your financial goals and dreams jump on my instagram account and have a look at who i am following um there are some amazing people and i don't follow necessarily big influencers i follow like 
everyday people, like people who've got like two or 300 followers and they're just everyday people just going, hey, I'm a mum showing my budgeting techniques or I'm sh uh, hey, I'm a mum with three kids showing with you how I, you know, put together the kids' lunches in a frugal way. Like that's what I love, that it's real and it makes me feel connected to a really strong, powerful community. Moving on to the next one and that is goals. All right, financial goals. All right, this might come to a bit of a shock for you, but I actually don't believe in having lots of goals. Um, particularly lots of financial goals. I like to keep it really simple and all my, uh, I have one big picture, one big long-term goal, which is my mindful money number. And I've shared this in a previous podcast about how I do financial goals, but our uh, mindful money number is, is $200,000. And um, it, all my medium and short-term goals are positively correlated to achieving that goal, but they're not many of them. I keep it limited and I keep it simple. And obviously everything has a deadline, but that's, that's it. And, for example, I will give myself a monthly goal, a quarterly goal, and then obviously an annual goal. Now, say for example, I achieve my one of one of my quarterly goals early before the deadline. Say I achieve it within two months instead of three months, and I achieved it, say you know, in February instead of the end of March. I don't go and replace that goal with a new one. I allow myself to enjoy the celebration and the reward of having additional space in my life to like take my foot off the gas and. Um, as I focus my energy on achieving the remaining goals left in, in within my deadline. Um, I don't feel the need, um, even though it's a tempt as I sometimes get when I'm feeling super motivated and inspired, especially when I'm following people on social media, um, to replace that new goal. I will wait until the deadline is up, the quarter is up, or the month's up, or the year's up, and then I will go and add fresh goals in then. I feel like, you know, it's a bit like, trying to pay off lots of people in debt, you know, if you've got multiple credit card debts. To have multiple goals, you start spreading yourself thinly, you're more likely to drop a ball, just like you're gonna drop on a goal. Um, I really wanna fine tune my energy and my focus and my purpose. I wanna get out of bed, know exactly what I'm doing and why, and which one I'm working on as a priority, and, and have like, a, just a bit, I guess, a symphony in my head as to what I'm gonna achieve. And I found this has helped me achieve my goals with so much more enjoyment and pleasure and efficiency and I'm not also I guess not setting myself up to fail but I'm not um, I'm not drowning myself and putting too much pressure on myself to overachieve I'm allowing myself the the pleasure of achieving that goal earlier and potentially even enjoying that reward sooner so that's really important don't give yourself new ones just because you've achieved them sooner don't undersell yourself from what you can achieve but but allow yourself that that enjoyment of going wow I achieved that or um, you know two weeks earlier let's just you know let's just chill let's just use this moment to recharge our batteries and again this is minimalism and money all right the next thing is my in my internet banking all right and this is internet banking is supposed to add simplicity to our lives it's supposed to make it efficient and easy to use so that we're not sitting in front of our internet banking accounts or in front of a screen we can get back on with our life whether it be with our kids or whether our family or with our friends or our hobbies or with our pets um, or you know our team sports or whatever it might be so I make a point of every month or so I go through my internet banking and I delete old biller codes and payees people that I, I don't need to transfer money anymore I want if I have to pay someone money um, I want to make sure I do it quickly and easily and also by removing all the old old payees that I don't use anymore, I'm less likely to make any errors and accidentally transfer money to someone that I, I don't need to. Um, so go through your internet banking and remove those people and you'll see that your internet banking actually looks so much neater and cleaner. And you know that the people who are there are people that you engage with and value in your, in your life because that's who you pay money to. It's something that's actually really, um, something I highly recommend everyone should do regardless whether you're a minimalist or not. It gives you a great opportunity to also see where the financial wastage and leakage is in, in your life. And, you know, for example, you might have, say, um, uh, a friend that you transferred money or you bought something from someone, say, on Gumtree and they sent you their internet banking details. You pay them their $50 or whatever it may be. You don't need to keep them saved in your internet banking. Delete it. You don't need, unless you're going to buy something from them again, just delete it. Keep your um, internet banking nice and clean. All right, next up is superannuation. All right, I have one superannuation account. One. Um, I've shared with you in Mindful Money, this is with Asgard, and to be more detailed, I'm in the Asgard Infinity ERAP superannuation account. Now, all of my, um, so all of my superannuation money goes into one account. I don't have multiple accounts lying around, wasting valuable 
money in fees and expenses and premiums. It's all there. And I also haven't filled my superannuation account with expensive managed funds. That is my underlying investments. All of my investments are either direct equities, so banks, supermarkets, pharmaceutical companies, transportation companies, infrastructure, buildings, materials, you know, blue chip Australian and international companies, as well as international ETFs, actually some Australian ETFs as well, and then listed investment companies. I've kept it really clean and simple and minimal. And I have done this purposely because the fees come down. See, when you look at an average managed fund, the fee can be between say 0.7% up to sometimes even 2.15 I've seen as a managed fund. I don't want to be wasting my money on those expensive fund manager fees because that's where your superannuation account fees can really blow out. I've kept it simple. So when I invest in, for example, say a bank, if I own that as a direct company, um, I don't pay any ongoing fees to own that. Obviously, I pay a little bit if I'm using a listed investment company or an ETF. However, I value that because that's a brilliant way to efficiently and effectively build a diversified portfolio where you don't have the stress and pressure of having to decide yourself what industry would I want to invest in, what company I should be buying, how should I be buying it, when should I be buying it, how much, all those very overwhelming questions. Like for any, I'd say for 90% of people, unless you're really passionate about picking your individual stocks, go with a listed investment company or an index-based ETF. And I say an index-based ETF because index-based um, ETFs are a long-term buy and hold. They don't try and uh, pick the market. They're you know, very conservative. They're looking for long-term investments. They're not trying to be a cowboy and, and beat the system and make quick money. They're, try they're basically buying long-term stocks in companies that are going to give you long-term capital growth opportunities and long-term income opportunities. And, and that is, is really important, particularly for your superannuation, because if you have an ETF that's, say, an active one, they're jumping in and out of stocks and you're paying a huge amount in brokerage. And more importantly, if they're any good, you're care paying a huge amount of capital gains tax along the way, which is going to really irritate you when you see that your super fund has to keep on paying out all this tax unnecessarily. So I take a long term buy and hold approach when it comes to not just my superannuation investments, but also my own investments. And on that note, um, I will also talk about our, my investments, but I'll talk towards that at, at the very end. So my superannuation all is in the one account and all invested in long term investments, uh, Australian shares, international shares through listed investment companies and index based ETFs. So it's really cost effective. And I think my fee total fee is something around about 0.4%. Obviously, I'm a financial planner, so I'm not paying myself, but it's not hard to get your fees down to 0.8% or less. And I have explained that in Mindful Money how to do that. I've also got a video on YouTube and I've also got um, stuff on IGTV explaining how to do that. The next thing is, is insurances. I have personal insurances. I have had personal insurances since I was about 22, 23 because I wanted to protect my financial well-being. I wanted to know that when I go to bed at night, if anything happens to me, I am still able to go and achieve my financial goals and dreams. Would it be buying a home, paying off my home loan, being able to retire at age 50, 55, you know, having all the, the luxuries or experiences that I value in my life, international travel, um, you know, health and well-being, being able to afford great quality food and vegetables for my kids and um, be able to you know, go for a weekend away um, with my partner, Tom. So to summarize, I have life cover, which is if I was to die, um, Tom would receive a certain amount of money lump sum tax free. And that covers my mortgage and any outstanding investment debts um, up to a certain amount so that he never needs to worry about a home loan. And in fact, any investments and excess assets pass to him and the, including the passive income. I have TPD cover, total and permanent disablement cover. So if I was to become disabled and couldn't work, again, similar amount of money, mortgage is cleared. A chunk of my investment loans are also cleared. Um, and then on top of it, I have income protection. So if I can't work due to a medical reason, I and I need to make adjustments in my life, I would receive 75% of my income until I was well enough to either return back to work or a maximum age of age 65. This is really important. So many people have might have income protection through their, their, say, their superannuation policies or through their employer packages, but quite often when they look at the fine print, they're only covered for two years. Now that's good, but it's not good enough, unfortunately. You need to make sure um, that you are covered to age 65 because most people who do go on claim and generally, if you're not back at work within two years, it's highly unlikely, statistics show. 
that is, that you are going to return back to work at all. So you'd hate to have an income protection policy that covers you only for two years. You want to know that you're covered to 65. And the premiums, yes, they do go up to cover yourself to, to age 65, but not by much when you consider, well, okay, that's an extra 30 years worth of cover. You know, it, it doesn't go up 30 times. It goes up, you know, a little bit more, but not that much more. And if you own that policy outside of superannuation, you pay for it out of your cash flow, most of these policies are actually um, tax deductible or a large portion of them are tax deductible. And then the fourth insurance policy that I have is a trauma cover. Uh, it's, it was actually invented by a South African heart surgeon who realized that when his patients who just saved their lives, you know, were going back to the workforce, he realized they were actually leaving the hospital with more stress in their lives than what they came in with. So he created this policy that pays people a lump sum if they suffer a major medical trauma, whether it be an illness or an accident, so that they can afford to reduce the financial stress and pressure in their lives. And they also had enough money to make the lifestyle adjustments to avoid having to end up back in hospital again. So whether that meant giving someone enough money to pay off their mortgage or giving someone enough money to be able to cut back to part-time work or someone enough money to pay for recovery and rehabilitation expenses. That's what that money is for. And yes, if you're thinking, well, I don't need insurances. I, I mean, obviously I don't know your personal situation, but I highly doubt that you, you don't need insurance. Most people need it. And if you have any sort of financial responsibility, uh, even a credit card, you most likely need some form of insurance. It's so important. And it's not until it's, you're not feeling well or you see a doctor or the doctor says I've got some bad news for you or we need to run some more tests, that's too late to go and apply for cover. You need to be doing it right now, right today. And my life cover, my TPD cover and my income protection policy are all covered and paid for in my superannuation account. Now, the reason why I've done that is it means it frees up my cash flow so I can focus on paying off a mortgage, which is you know, another thing uh, in my life I'm trying to minimize as quickly as possible. And yes, that does mean it impacts my overall portfolio value. But for the time being, I'm comfortable with that and I'm happy with that. And I accept that um, downside because I save more money when I look at the after tax interest and time savings by focusing on my mortgage. But it is something to sort of bear in mind if you are going to take out life cover, TPD cover and income protection through your super. The trauma cover has to be paid through your cash flow and that comes out of my personal everyday account through a direct debit, not off a credit card. In fact, with the exception of my IVF, um, I guess you would call it embryo rent um, and egg rent, um, that's the only expense that comes off my credit card. And the only reason why that comes off my credit card, not out of a family bank account through a direct debit is I never ever wanted to run the risk of somehow that debit failing and obviously risking those eggs and embryos being destroyed. So I just did it as a, I guess, a peace of mind and safety aspect. And then there's one of one policy of each. I don't have multiple life covers. I don't have multiple trauma covers or multiple TPD cover policies held everywhere. It's just in the one spot, which is important. So if I ever, someone has to claim on my behalf or I have to claim, I go to the one insurance provider, fill out the one piece of paperwork and it's a one lump sum. And it's also most often the most cost effective way. The next subject I wanna talk about before I end with how I do money and minimalism when it comes to investing, and that is shopping and including luxury spending in there if you like as well. I'm a minimalist when it comes to my own personal shopping, particularly fashion. I'm a fussy shopper. You don't wanna go clothes shopping with me. I'm annoying because I'll like looking at things and trying things on, but I won't buy anything. I need to think things through. There's probably only about a handful of brands and shops that I actually like going to. If I go into others, I like to feel like I trust the brand, that the size is gonna fit me properly, the cut's gonna fit me properly, the fabric's gonna be durable, it's not gonna be a high maintenance um, item that needs to be dry cleaned every single time I wear it. It's gonna work with all the existing um, items in my capsule wardrobe. I'm a fussy shopper, I don't like you know to go to 10 different shops. I really try and buy pre-loved clothing. I love high-end on Facebook. I love uh, Trading in Style. Um, I have never actually bought from Trading in Style yet, but they on their Instagram account, which is amazing, they're always showing the most incredible Australian and international designer clothing, shoes, and accessories, you know, at a significant discount. And it's it's about saving money, but also reducing my environmental footprint as well. And, you know, landfill, because we know the textile industry does so much damage to our planet. So my shopping is very simple. Even my grocery shopping. I pr shop at predominantly two different uh, sh shops, uh, Woolworths, because again, I get 
loyalty points, uh, which are linked to my Qantas Frequent Flyer program, which is my only Frequent Flyer program, and uh, and then Harris Farm. I find that you know ordering online, it's free shipping or delivery over a certain amount, and often when the beautiful boxes arrive of all the food, there's no plastic bags involved at all. Uh, quite often they throw, and I don't know if this is just me, but they quite often throw um, a whole pile of extra free fruit and vegetables into our box. Um, and, you know, it, I, I, that's what I value. I don't, I don't you know, I, I guess occasionally I go to the markets and try and do that as well. But with um, being pregnant and with a 18 month year old who loves to run and I'm not getting I'm getting bad at trying to keep up with her going to the markets at this point in time especially if I don't have if I do or don't have Rocco it's a bit stressful for me so I'm happy to outsource so I have more time in my life the um, delivery on that note of shopping and clothing shopping also I do the same with my kids there aren't many shops there's like again a handful of shops that I will get my kids clothing from and I do again with them trying to buy as much as I possibly can pre-loved um, Retycle is a great website for high quality sort of designer goods not that I buy my kids really designer goods but um, you know, there's a couple of brands I really trust because kids wear clothes out. They get dropped food over them. They get heavily stained. Uh, they get ripped. They outgrow them quickly. Um, it's, it is hard and I'm all for, I love hand-me-downs as well. And I always share the love. As soon as my kids are out of those clothes, I, ha I happily pass them on to people who I know will appreciate them and, and need them. It will help them save money as well. Finally, let's talk about investing and how I do minimalism, money and investing in my life. Okay. So I have... I have my own personal investment portfolio, which is something I've been building since I was in my very early 20s. Um, and that includes property and a direct share or well, properties and a direct share portfolio. Um, Tom has his own investment portfolio as well, but we agreed when we had our daughter Apple that we would combine, uh, we draw a line in the sand actually and, and say, look, what you've got's yours, what I've got's mine, but going forward together, we're a family. So let's build our investments together. So our investments together are very simple. It's one joint share portfolio and any new money that we have or any money that we use from our debt recycling strategy. And again, there's a podcast explaining how what debt recycling is and how it's a very powerful tool in building wealth if you're comfortable with, you know, with debt. And that's our investment portfolio. And that is at this stage is actually all one listed investment company. Because again, that money is really well diversified. It's very cost effective and I've outsourced all the time and energy needed to be picking the individual underlying stocks. Now, over time, I will definitely add individual stocks to that portfolio, but to, as I'm still in the process of building our foundation of our share portfolio, um, that is what I've, I've made the foundation because it's with a listed investment company or an index style ETF is you reduce the volatility. It's very simple. It's really well diversified. Um, I've reduced our investment risk and we can pick and choose the individual stocks and companies that we want to add in as you know, as new money comes in and we're able to do that. But that is where I would say probably a large majority of, of our financial success will come from is that one joint share portfolio. And because it's only one, you know, it's it's we can it's one place for us to look, it's one place for us to check, it's one place for us to review and track and see how we're going in pro in the, the progress of our financial goals. And as I always say, progress equals success. When you see that you are starting to make steps. In achieving your financial goals, it feels really good. You feel inspired to, to go again, to see what else you can do to stretch further. You realize how powerful you are and it's, it's just the most liberating, um, euphoric experience. And it's funny, only the other weekend, I was just going through our finances and just checking everything, making sure everything was on top of it and being paid. And Tom came past and I was like, oh, look at this, I wanna show you this. And I showed him like how much of our mindful money number um, we had built so far in tracking toward, and you could see it as a percentage, a dollar amount, and as a percentage amount of our mindful money number, which is $200,000 a year in passive income. And he was like, oh, wow, actually, I thought we know, I thought we were behind, but that's actually really good. That's great, you know, and he felt really committed and connected. You know, he's so much more on board with it. Each time I show him, he's like, yeah, we know that's, that's, he supports me, he encourages me, like, actually, you're doing a great job, this is so good. And he, I get to look at him and go, wow, you are really grateful for what I'm doing here, which makes me feel even more valued as a, as a team member in this family unit. And, you know, we both have this, the pressure and stress is off our shoulders because we know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Tom works crazy hours. I mean, he, he's in Melbourne this morning. He quite often gets off, up to go to work at 4.30 in the morning, gets home at seven o'clock at night. He worked on Sunday, treating horses in quarantine. 
um, you know, it's when you know you've you're working together as a team. Um, from a minimalism perspective, you minimize all the stress because you've got financial goals that you're working on together. And and when one's feeling flat or low, the other one props the other one up. And we remind each other of what we're working on. And, and as I said, there is light at the end of the tunnel. All right, everyone, look, this is the end of the podcast for today. I always seem to go on for quite a bit, but you now know how I do minimalism and money. i have shared with you all the hacks and tricks and steps that I personally take to run our finances with clarity, purpose, and efficiency. Efficiency as we achieve all of our short-term goals, Goals, medium term goals and long term goals all heading in the one direction to achieve our big mindful money number. Now if you don't have a copy of mindful money I highly recommend you do. You can get it from the book depository if you're based overseas internationally or you can uh, get it from Booktopia or any other good quality bookstore. Uh, it's a brilliant book I, I have to say even I read it again and I'm like yep this is so easy to understand it's straight to the point um, and there's so much advice in there that a lot of financial other books don't actually have or maybe say stuff that's not quite accurate or true. So I'm going to sign off now because I my podcast is going for a little bit longer than what I would ideally hope they would. But I want to say everyone have a fantastic week. Thank you so much for listening. If you can leave a rating and review, I would greatly appreciate it. And of course, make sure you're following me on Instagram at TV and at Canna Campbell Official. All right, everyone. Ciao for now.